Welcome to the Good Leadership Podcast, where we discuss research-backed strategies and techniques with recognized thought leaders that will deliver results that matter and create lasting change for leaders at all levels. Welcome to this episode of the Good Leadership Podcast. I'm glad to be joined by John Miller today. And a little bit about John Miller. In early 1986, John began his career providing leadership and sales management training to Twin City Corporations and Industries. This is how and when he created the QBQ, the question behind the question method for personal accountability. Throughout the next decades of selling and facilitating training for executives and managers, he discovered the incredible need for personal accountability. And in 1995, he started conducting programs around this, around the personal accountability and the QBQ approach, which is a topic that we're going to be unpacking during today's program, which is going to help all of you in terms of personal accountability. Welcome to the program, John. Thank you, Charles. Appreciate it. Glad to be here. Love to always start each episode by getting a little more of your background and what got you interested in this approach. What did you find within those organizations that you were a part of or that you taught learning and development for of of why this is such a critical focus or topic that needs to be addressed? Blame. (laughs) That's what I found. Lots of blame. Lots of finger pointing. If only that department would do their job right. Why do we have to go through all this change? Stuff like that. But let me go back a little further. I came out of Cornell in 1980 and joined a big company called Cargill. And I spent five years working eight to five at a desk, not enjoying myself very much. And one day, the short story is I got into the business of selling management training in Minneapolis, St. Paul, as you mentioned. And there I was calling on executives. I was only 27, 28 years old. And then I started facilitating three-day workshops, two-day workshops, using my mentor's content, you know, my, my boss's content, because I was late 20s. And I sat in these sessions, and what I started to hear, Charles, was what I just alluded to. Why do we have to go through all this change? When are my salespeople going to do their job right? Why can't that department get its act together? Uh, who dropped the ball? Who made the mistake? And one day, I remember around 1994, I coined a phrase, the question behind the question, And it got shortened to the QBQ. And I went out and taught it to a group called St. Jude Medical in St. Paul, a very wealthy, successful company. They make heart valves. And I taught it to them over a few minutes. And it was just a little small idea. I just birthed, if you will. And I came back a few months later, Charles, and they were using it. And if you know much about the training industry, I'm being facetious, you're an expert. A lot of stuff isn't used. But when I came back and they were actually talking the QBQ, the question behind the question, this idea that helps us practice personal accountability, I thought to myself, wow, maybe I have something here. That was 1994. And soon after that, I left my mentor, went off on my own, and here we are today. Great insight. Thank you for providing that. So let's dive a little bit in more detail to this approach. And could you explain for us how the QBQ framework works in helping overcome the negative initial reactions, blainstorming, and promoting better results? Absolutely. In every organization, and this is this extends to families and, and churches and nonprofits. I mean, all throughout our lives, there's a, there's a propensity to do what we call externalize, to look outside of, of us for answers. So if something's not going my way, I'm a victim. Why is this happening to me? Why don't they support me more? Why don't I ever get a break? If something goes wrong in a project, who made the mistake? Who missed the deadline? Who dropped the ball? If something gets delayed, when are they going to start doing their job right? When are they going to get me the information I need to make a decision? So whenever things go wrong for me, it's easy to look outside of myself for the answer. And we ask those questions that externally point at other people and events around us that I can't control. So the question behind the question, the QBQ, and the keyword, and it took me a few years of teaching this, Charles, before I even realized underline the word behind, the question behind the question. So if that first question that comes to me is, who made the mistake? The question behind the question might be, well, what can I do to help solve the problem? If the first question that comes to me is, why don't they do their job right? Maybe I need to ask the question behind the question, how can I be my best today? And so this idea that we've been teaching for many years now gets rid of three traps, victim thinking, finger pointing and blame, and procrastination. And those are real human problems inside most organizations. You're completely right. And that's something that's still pervasive in many organizations today. It hasn't gone away. So it won't go away, okay? I'm in agreement, even though I wish it would, but you're right. It's something that we're going to have ongoing in the future. 
And it's interesting that this framework encourages us to focus on what and how questions rather than the why, when, and who questions. Can you elaborate on why it's important to use this specific approach in generating better questions? Well, first of all, we are like a good practical tool. It's not fair for us to come into an organization, stand on a stage and tell 200 people, hey, you need to be accountable. We need to show people how to do that on a daily basis. So the next time someone in your world drops the ball or mistakes are made or something doesn't go the way you hoped it ha- would have gone, how do I respond to that? Well, the QBQ has three, three guidelines to it. The first is question behind the question. QBQs always begin with what or how. Secondly, they always contain the word I, and let's come back to that. And thirdly, they always focus on action. So instead of asking, when is someone going to train me? Let's ask, what can I do today to develop myself? So the focus is what and how. What can I do? How can I make a difference? And of course, the I, the personal pronoun is critical. And the question behind the question leads me to action. It's just inherent in asking these accountable questions. So instead of asking externally focused questions, we ask questions that literally, well, not literally, because there's no real mirror in front of me, but they make me look in the mirror and say, well, what could I have done differently and how can I move forward today? That's personal accountability. And that's what we do. Let's unpack those three types and, and give a little bit more understanding as far as you know why you should ask them. And let's first start with the why questions, because from my personal experience, those why questions, right, they make you feel powerless because it's always externally focused. Why can't the corporation do this? Why can't my team do this? It's really hard to change those around to be something that you can control and do yourself, correct? Right. The easiest thing in the world is to look outside of myself and have a pity party, feel sorry for me. I often ask groups, you know, how many pity parties have you had? And you were the only guest invited. It's easy to say, oh, poor me, woe is me. And we could look at our entire culture today and the victim thinking and the entitlement that's out there. But what we stress is, I can only change me. So what about my entitlement thinking? What about my feeling sorry for myself? What about my victim thinking? So the minute I ask anything like, why is this happening to me? Instead of what can I do to move forward or how can I help solve the problem or what can I do to contribute? All I've done is put myself exactly what you just said, Charles, in a powerless state. I'm now a victim. I'm sinking into the quagmire of victimitis. And we like to tell people all the time, here's the key about victim thinking. We ask groups, when we play victim, who are we serving? And sometimes people, you know, nicely say, I'm just serving myself. No, no, no. I'm not serving anybody when I play victim. I'm not serving my colleagues, my company, my employer, my family, or myself when I wallow in victim thinking. So victim thinking is just inherently a bad place to be. And I've had people from all walks of life, some people with terminal or stage four cancer, who have read the QBQ book and said, this helped me currently move forward in my life and not feel sorry for myself. It was written initially for corporations, but we found the QBQ message can really go anywhere. We've got a group of veterans dealing with PTSD who use the book, the QBQ, to get out of their victim thinking and deal with their PTSD and look in the mirror and say, I got to take ownership for the way I respond to people around me, blah, blah, blah. We could go on forever. But the, the personal accountability message, Charles, it just applies everywhere. That's right. And and it's it's hard, that message to take sometimes to say that, you know, victim thinking doesn't serve anyone, including yourself. Pity parties never made you feel better. There's a better way to think about a better perspective to take. And you even mentioned something too, which is somewhat counterintuitive, and there might be some pushback on is you say stress is really a choice because whatever the trigger event is, we can always choose our responses. Yeah. And and, and you know that because you're you're in this training world. You, you understand. I, I can feel it. You understand that we always choose our response. What's always kind of fun for me as a speaker is when you say that to an audience, you get about 98% of the heads nodding. And then you get a couple of people going, oh, that's not true, John. You know, the world does it to me. We have a story in the QBQ book about a woman at FedEx who emailed me the afternoon I spoke up in Toronto. And she said, I don't agree with that. And I'm going to prove you wrong. Well, about three weeks later, she emailed and she said, you know what? Every single time I was angry, frustrated, mad, feeling vindictive, whatever, I was choosing that emotion. I was choosing that thought. 
And it's just better to understand that stress is a choice instead of saying, well, you know, the world creates my stress. My teenage son creates my stress. My, my boss creates my stress. I do it to myself. And to stay out of victim thinking means I can really contribute and serve people around me. It's taking responsibility for your actions and your thoughts, and that's a great way to do it. And this whole approach is around designing better questions and not starting questions with certain words. So we talked about the why, the when. When we ask when questions, questions that start with the word when, it really gives us a opportunity to procrastinate instead of take action on what we need to take action on. Right, Charles. And, and let me just share with your audience Again, where I developed this content, I didn't get it at Cornell where I went to school. You know, at Cornell, a guy named Ken Blanchard, Tom Peters, John Nesbitt, they all went to Cornell. I didn't even know these guys. <laughs> they were older than I am. I didn't get it at Cornell. I didn't take it from, you know, another speaker, author. I sat in 10,000 hours of workshops in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and I started to hear people say, oftentimes whispering to me in the hallway, well, when are they going to give us the vision? When is someone going to clarify my job? When are they going to get me the information I need to make a decision? Instead of turning that around and saying, well, what can I do today to make a difference? How can I contribute right now? So <clears throat> I am no, excuse me, I'm no psychologist. I'm no expert on why we procrastinate. You know, people get into perfectionism and fear. Bottom line, when I ask, when will Charles solve this problem? I have basically just said, I, John Miller, will do nothing today, and I will sit back and wait for Charles to take action. That sounds like procrastination to me. And as we say in QBQ, procrastination is the friend of failure. End of story. If I want to fail, all I, do is, all I need to do is get out of bed in the morning and say, well, when will they get back to me? When will somebody solve this problem? When will somebody improve this place? You know, you know, I wrote a book called Outstanding, 47 Ways to Make Your Organization Exceptional. And the only reason I mention that is the dedication is to those people who care enough to improve the place. That's what we're talking about. People who work somewhere and say, I want to take ownership for improving the place. And when I say, when will Charles do this or that? I've just said, well, I will do nothing. And that's just a crummy way to live, in my opinion. You're right. The third type of word that you don't start questions with, if you want to hold yourself personally accountable, is the who. Because the who is looking for a scapegoat, usually. Once again, it's not identifying what you can do. It's putting the blame or the control with someone else. Absolutely. It's just the finger pointing game. I mean, we can call it whatever you want, blame storming versus brainstorming, the blame game, finger pointing. All I know is as I called on executives for all those years in the Twin Cities, and of course, ever since then, we, we live in Denver, Colorado now, just to clarify, I've been here 25 years. But what I found was silos, departments that were really just silos. You know, you got accounting, you got HR, you got legal, you got manufacturing, you got sales. None of this is new to your clients. I understand that. But bottom line, what we saw is what we call this. Fingers, our arms crossed across my chest, fingers pointing and everybody else. We labeled it the company coat of arms. It's page 45 of the QBQ book, Charles. It's the only image in there. And more people have referenced that than any other page, I think, because there's so much finger pointing. So the minute I say, as I've said, who dropped the ball? Who missed the deadline? Who made the mistake? Who gave me these people? Oh, wait a minute. I hired them. <laughs> the minute I say those who questions, I am absolutely pointing fingers and looking for a culprit. And that's not good. You're right. And really, if you want to be a successful leader, there's always going to be challenges to overcome. No matter what you're trying to accomplish, there's going to be a barrier. There's going to be some parts of it which you have no control over and some parts in which you do. So I like how you kind of twisted the serenity prayer for the QBQ approach. And then, you know, I love what your dad said because he was a wrestling coach at Cornell for, what, 25 years. And he said, you know, to you, he said, John, you know, there's three people you're going to have to beat if you want to be successful, right? And I'd love for you to share that story with our listeners. I've written five books and my dad has made it into every book. <laughs> not, not, not huge. Just one story per book. I didn't overdo it, but the man was a good teacher. Uh, he was a pastor of a Christ, of Christian churches, two, two different churches for 40 years. And he was a wrestling coach, Ivy League wrestling coach for 25 years. So he just had a lot to teach. He was a storyteller. And he'd say, Johnny, tonight on that mat, you have three people to beat. Number one, your opponent. Number two, yourself, overcome your fears. Well, that still applies. And then thirdly, he'd say, and you need to beat the referee. Wait a minute, dad. 
You mean the, the guy in the black and white striped shirt who made three questionable calls? I only lost by a point. If he hadn't made those three questionable calls, I would have won the match. And he'd always say, you must be, this is the punchline, and I'm shortening this metaphor, but this the punchline is, you must be good enough to beat the ref. You must be good enough to beat the ref. And I always kid people about my daughter, Molly, who is actually on our team now at QBQ Inc. She's in her 30s. When she was in high school, she'd come home and say, well, Coach Jay said we would have won the game if the officials had called more penalties on the other team. And then I'd have to say, but Molly, your team didn't score any goals. <laughs> they lost one to nothing. And the 40-year-old coach would teach the athletes to blame the referees. And that's what happens in America today. We're always teaching blame. We're modeling blame. I, I mean, we could talk about politics and people make, uh, hearings in Congress, all kinds of finger pointing going on. But all that matters is John Miller as a father, as a grandfather, as a husband, as a professional. Am I asking who done it kind of questions or am I asking what can I do right now to solve the problem? What can I do to make a difference? Those are much better questions. I must be good enough to beat the ref. My last comment there. Charles, is the referee is a metaphor for anything beyond my control. I cannot control the officials. So can I be better on the field or on the mat? My dad would simply say, all right, you lost by a point, but could you have taken your opponent down one more time for another two points? Could you have escaped in the third period? He always made me look in the mirror, and that's a good thing. That is good, and I love just your twist on the serenity prayer that if you want to win, don't focus on or complain about the things beyond your control, period. Some problems are best to let go of. For all the rest, be good enough to beat the ref. So two myths we find with accountability. First myth is that we believe it's all about holding others accountable. So I hear this a lot from training programs to leaders within companies. It's, I want to hold others accountable. And then the second myth is when we think about accountability, it's a team thing or a group thing. So perhaps you could unpack those two because you really dispel both of those myths within your book and your research, and it's proven very successful. Again, that came from my experience calling on executives, sitting in thousands of hours of workshops. People would say, accountability is important. Then they talk about holding their people accountable. Parents do this all the time. They want to hold the child accountable. But wait a minute, mom and dad, that's excellent. But are, are you practicing personal accountability in your own life? And that's one reason, reason we actually wrote a parenting book, because we had QBQ clients saying, but I want to use this at home. And we'd say, well, go ahead. But they'd say, but we need it in a parenting format. So it applies everywhere, at work or with parenting or with friendships. We're always trying to hold someone else accountable instead of saying, what can I do to improve me today? How can I be a better person? What can I do to learn new skills? Again, that's personal accountability. It's not about holding others accountable. Now, don't get me wrong. I know many, many of your clients, probably most of them, Charles, are managers, leaders. Absolutely. Part of management is setting standards, defining objectives, and coaching people to those standards and objectives. And when they don't reach them, we have to coach. Sometimes we have to confront on negative behaviors. And yes, sometimes we have to terminate. But that's not what QBQ is about. We're not talking about holding others accountable. We're talking about John Miller being personally accountable, improving self. And the other myth is about teams. Because all those buzz phrases that would come up like team accountability, shared accountability, mutual accountability, accountability groups. Well, those are all great, but let's make sure, and here's the key, we're not hiding behind the team. The minute we hide behind the team with language like, well, the team didn't get it done. The team didn't have enough resources. Nobody gave the, gave the team a clear vision or mission. The team didn't have the resources. Nobody on the team cares as much as I care. <laughs> the minute we say things like that, we're blaming the team. And I guarantee you, if you want teamwork, it starts with every person on the team practicing personal accountability. Otherwise, you have this. You have finger pointing and blame within the team. So we're not talking about river rafting and going on boondoggles to do team building. We're talking about individuals saying, what can I do to support the team? How can I be my best today? So accountability is not a group thing. It's not a team thing. It's a me thing. And secondly, it's not something I do to others. It's something I do myself. Those are the two myths. Well, and that gets back to the only person you can really change is yourself, right? So even as a manager, you don't change people. You can coach them, you can counsel them, 
you can guide them in making better decisions, but change only comes from the inside as a result of the decisions they make for themselves. Can I say amen? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, absolutely. One of the greatest challenges we've seen over the years is young male managers, men in their 20s, you know, basically say, I'm going to change that guy till it kills him. You know? <laughs> Sorry, you can coach and counsel and guide and confront and, and maybe terminate and hire whatever, but you can't change somebody. And that's what QBQ is all about. So what it's amazing is when you talk about accountability with managers and they're in a group session, I, I can hear it. I can see it in their eyes, Charles. It's like, yeah, my people need this. And then we start saying, well, here's a QBQ for managers. What can I do to be a better coach today? How can I get to know each of my people differently because they're different? What can I do to improve my leadership abilities? How can I gain management skills? Because a lot of people are just promoted into management for no other reason than they were good technically. You know that. So the minute they hear that, they go, oh, wait a minute. This QBQ message, even though I'm a manager, this QBQ message is for me. I can be better. And this is all reiterating the point that you want to ask how and what questions, and they need to be eye focused. So the, that I needs to be a part of that question that you ask to build more personal accountability. Well, that's that's a critical piece. Um, I always kid people about, uh, I don't know if you know who Dave Ramsey is, Charles, the, the finance guy. I've been on his show a few times. He found QBQ in the Memphis airport, stood there, read half of it, felt so guilty. He decided he better buy it. So, so he had me on the show. But the only reason I mentioned Dave Ramsey is he, every interview I've ever had with him, he says, so John, what's the biggest takeaway from, from QBQ for people? And I always say the same thing. I say, Dave, I can only change me. End of story. Can't change my wife. Can't change my teenage son. Can't change my boss. Can't change my colleagues. I can only change me. And you know what, Charles? I didn't invent that idea. It's a truth. So I didn't invent it. You didn't invent it. But when we say it out loud to people, they go, oh, wow, that's, that's brilliant. I never thought of that. <laughs> I never thought I can only change me. So I got to stop trying to change my colleagues and my, my coworkers and even my staff. I need to look in the mirror and say, how can I improve myself today? That's why the QBQ always contains the word I, not we. This is not about, hey, what can we do? Now, that question sounds good, but that's like hiding behind the team. What can I do to support the we today? That's great. And that a lot of people need to hear that more than once because they've gotten these habitual patterns where it's always about some other person, the victim mentality. So it's just saying that to yourself enough to really start believing it and, and your mindset will change over time. I mean, I can attest that yeah, marriages will become a lot happier if you stop trying to change the other person, right? Focus on you. I, I got to say, you know, we have seven children and they're all married. All seven are married. Okay. We're empty nesters. Hallelujah. And whenever any of these millennials and Gen Zers in any way communicate to us, they're having a little marital stress. Both Karen and I will text them back one thing, QBQ. I think they're tired of hearing it. Stop trying to change the other person, period. End of story. You got it. So the third big part of this approach, this framework, is, is really focusing on action, to make it action-focused by using certain verbs. Um, action you know, is better than inaction, and you list some powerful reasons as to why. It, it leads to mistakes, but it also brings forth the learning opportunities that inaction leads to stagnation and atrophy. You're not learning from your experiences. Action leads towards solutions. Well, inaction holds in the past or procrastinates. So speak a little bit more on that, on how important it is to really make this action focus and how that's better than taking no action at all. You know, that that part might come from my own natural personality. I'm a Myers-Briggs ESTJ. I'm a Wilson Learning driver style person. I'm an Enneagram 8, if any of your clients know what Enneagram is. But I still believe for any personality, it's better to get something done than to complain or whine or bemoan our situation. Of course, there are some times to hold off, of course, but more often than not, I'd rather be the person who is told to wait than the one who waits to be told. And where did I get that kind of idea? Not just my own personality, but I had a VP of HR years ago who said, John, if you could hook up a machine to the back of our building and measure the inertia, the lethargy, the procrastination, the number of people waiting to be told what to do next or waiting for a clearer vision, it would be off the charts. 
we want people to get stuff done. I had another client who said, you know, this vision casting is great, but I want to know what my people are going to do before lunch. So we built all of that into QBQ. What can I do today to make a difference? Action is important. And you have some powerful stories in the book. I'd love for you to talk about one or two of them. I'm either Jacob or Judy. Just showing this in action, right? And in some cases, it's because of the framework they've learned. But in some cases, this really epitomizes, this illustrates what it means to be personally accountable without having to have direction from someone else. Just it's part of your nature and going above and beyond for the customer. Yeah, that's right. You know, sometimes people say, can you come speak on customer service? And we'll say, yeah, we'll speak on QBQ. And then we'll tell this story. I was in the Rock Bottom restaurant on a busy Thursday at noon. There were no, no places to sit, no booths, no tables. And they sat me at the bar and I was waiting a few minutes. And a young man runs by me carrying a big load of dirty dishes on a heavy tray. And he stops and he looks at me and he says, sir, have you been helped? And I said, no, but I'm kind of in a rush. He said, well, I can help you, sir. What would you like? And, you know, I said, ah, oh, the salad and maybe a roll. And he said, great. What would you like to drink? I said, well, I have a Diet Coke. It's my favorite. And he said, I'm oh, sorry, sir. We only sell Pepsi products. And I said, ah, that's all right. I'll have water and lemon. He said, great. So he's gone. And a couple minutes later, he's back with the salad and the roll and the water and the lemon. And I, this is a very key part of this story, Charles. And as a speaker, the more you tell your stories, you kind of find nuggets that you didn't see when you first started telling the story. But I was, I was satisfied with the water and the lemon and the salad and the roll. He did not need to return. But I ask your clients right now, your members, how competitive is your marketplace today? How competitive, competitive is it? So do we need to go above and beyond? Do we need to be the company with the extra edge? Well, that's only going to happen when we have people, individuals going the extra mile. The extra edge comes from the extra mile people go. So anyway... I'm sitting there enjoying my lunch, and suddenly I feel the wind of enthusiasm blowing behind my back. The long arm of service stretches over my shoulder, places right next to my plate a 20-ounce bottle of Diet Coke, which is what I'd asked for. And I said, wow, thanks. He says, you're welcome. He takes off. And I remember thinking, I'm going to hire him, and I don't care if he went to college. (laughs) That's another discussion. But anyway, I want to hire somebody who takes action and cares about the customer and has a, a heart of service and has energy and desire. And I just, I just sensed all this good stuff, accountability. So I called him over and I said, I thought you didn't sell Coke products. He says, we don't. I said, well, where did this come from? He says, grocery store around the corner. I said, really? Who paid for it? He said, I did, sir. Just a dollar out of my tip money. <laughs> so I hired him for sales. <laughs> And then I said, how did you have time to go get it? I'll never forget it. He straightens, he smiles, and he says, I didn't go get it, sir. I sent my manager. (laughs) How many of us would like to send our managers, Charles? And I said, I just stared at him like, wow. And then I said, why? Why did you do this? He looked kind of disappointed. He said, I'm sorry, sir. Didn't you want one? Didn't you want a Diet Coke? I said, yes, I did. You went the extra mile. And there's more to that story. But bottom line, he didn't, as he was running past where I was sitting and he stopped, he, he, he didn't say, hey, who's supposed to be covering this area? He didn't say, why don't I get paid more? He didn't say, when are we going to get additional training? And he didn't blame the customer. Why can't the customer learn to read our menu? He simply said, how can I serve you today, sir? That is a QBQ. And his name was Jacob. His last name was Miller. There's no relationship here. John Miller, Jacob Miller. But that's the kind of person I want on my team. But more importantly, Charles, that's the kind of person I want to be. Great story. And I've heard this approach, too. And then the Ritz Carlton does this question behind the question in their customer service, really going the extra mile that if someone that's staying at their hotel says, you know, what time does the restaurant close? They'll say, OK, it closes at um, you know 4 p.m. But they also will send them the menu and know kind of that unstated question behind the question to go above and beyond Nordstrom's used to do this all the time with customers and because he wanted to say, what does exemplary customer service mean? Well, it means if someone has a package that they bought maybe at Macy's and they need it wrapped, you just don't say, we can't wrap that. You wrap it for them. So it's all these things that are really just taking that level, that customer service level above and beyond, because you're right, we're in such a competitive industry, regardless of the company that you work for, what can you do to forge a strong connection with the customer to go above and beyond really answer that question behind the question and really differentiate your brand. 
Well, absolutely. And I, I tell groups this all the time. If we had the time to un- unveil all your favorite customer service st- uh, stories, you know, ask a group, tell me your favorite customer service story. You know what we'd find? If we could unveil every customer service story people love to tell, and, and you tore it apart, and you, you broke it down, you'd find that little moment, that moment where somebody did something for you they didn't have to do. And that's how we define ser- service at QBQ Incorporated. Somebody doing something something for another that they don't have to do. And that's a very key concept because anytime we rave about customer service and we're telling a friend, it's because somebody did something for us they didn't have to do. It's that simple. And that's what Jacob and the Diet Coke is all about. That's great. And in the book and in your research, which I love because it, it takes time to learn this methodology because you default to certain patterns by asking questions in a certain way. So you list different categories of questions and and you break it down by category. And there's, you know, the first one is the customer service incorrect questions. And they start with the when, the why, the who, you know, when will shipping start to get orders right and on time? Why does customers expect so much? Who's going to take care of the customer? And you transform into how can I serve them? What can I do to live the power of one? So that's a great way just to practice and just to reprogram your thinking around these questions to build that personal accountability muscle and really to become better at what you do because you realize that now you're framing a question and you can improve that aspect, right? Because now it's under your control. Regardless of our profession, like we've done a lot of work over the years with with schools. Now, schools aren't our major focus. Most, Most of our clients, you know, Charles, are corporations. But you go into a school and you'll you'll find people who are going to be honest and they'll say, sometimes teachers say, why can't we get better parents? Why can't we get better parents? Because then we'd have better students. You know, so it's easy no matter what our profession. Doctors might say, why can't I get better patients? (laughs) Whether I'm in manufacturing or I'm in sales, it doesn't matter. Customer service, I can ask a question that externally focuses on someone else and leads me to feeling sorry for myself, finger pointing, blaming, all those things. Absolutely. Personal accountability. It's just a great way to live life. It is not a destination, which some people think it is. It's a moment to moment practice by avoiding the incorrect questions and asking better questions instead. You have read the book. I read it and I value the approach and I'm still working on reprogramming my questions that I ask around these topics because it's uh, it's really difficult after years of having uh, the why questions, right? Being asked in my mind and me asking others when, why, and uh, who's doing what? <laughs> Charles, I'm sure you are living a life of accountability, but I, I will say this, if I could, without sounding in any way haughty or proud. Sometimes people will say, oh, I know what accountability is. I know what it is. It's, it's a word that we hear all the time, but until you break it down with QBQ and you, and you start saying, well, don't ask, when will my wife do this? And start asking, what can I do to serve her? Instead of asking, you know, why aren't my people at work motivated? Wait a minute, what can I do to be a, a better coach for them? The minute we pause and stop focusing on that other person and asking those QBQs that begin with what or how, contain an I, focus on action, then we're really living accountabil- accountability on in, in a daily basis. And that's when people have said to us, oh, I thought I knew what responsibility and accountability were before I met QBQ. But then when I learned the QBQ, I realized even though I was an accountable person in my mind, I was still saying, when will that department do their job? And that's just not a good focus. It's better to say, what can I do to be my best today? You're right. And that's what I love about your approach is a practical framework that gets you better at this skill. A lot of programs, books on this topic is very generalized, theoretical. It's not this practical framework that allows you to practice it get better at it each and every day. Before we end this episode, I always like to end with, what's the one thing that they should start on if someone's new to this framework, really wants to build more personal accountability, what's that first step for them to um, tackle? Well, thank you. First of all, understanding the QBQ, the three steps, the three guidelines to the methodology and all that. But I would look inside and say, what frustrates me the most? You know, frustration is really, it results from black goals. What frustrates me? What disappoints me? Of course, those emotions can lead to anger. Anger is a secondary emotion. We don't want to get too deep into psychology here. But try to pinpoint, when do I feel frustrated? When do I feel let down? And then say, okay, wait a minute. It's often around that person at work, that person at home. Have I been focusing on them and trying to change them? Or can I focus more on my response to them? So be thinking about what frustrates you, what disappoints you. When do you feel let down? When do you feel maybe even angry? And then say, okay, 
formulate a QBQ? What can I do to let go of what that person has been doing? And how can I change me? What can I do to serve that person? How about just talking to them at work? You know, you've seen this, Charles, at work, you see a lot of people, they're still email and instant messaging and texting or whatever, or just using Slack internally, whatever. They're not just going over to that person's desk and talking to them. What can I do to improve communication? Because that's my job, not somebody else's. So I would really start with what frustrates me and, and go from there and think, am I trying to change others or am I working on myself? If I want to work on myself, I can use the QBQ to do that. Great advice. Thank you so much, John, for joining me today on this episode of the Good Leadership Podcast. Remind our listeners how they can learn more about you and connect with you. I always laugh at that question only because we used to give out phone numbers, addresses. <laughs> now it's like QBQ.com. Charles, just swing by QBQ.com and say hello. If you like this episode, then please share it on social media and consider leaving a review or rating. If there are specific leadership topics or industry leaders you'd like us to feature on the podcast, we are welcome to your suggestions. Remember, knowledge's transformative power is only activated when it is acted upon. So what actions are you going to take on the insights and knowledge shared in this episode?